この本、僕は読ませていただいたんですけど、大変、あの、まず面白かったです。Thank you. なので、ありがとうございます。<笑>ありがとうございます。Thank you. で、あの、なので今回先生にお目にかかれるっていうのは非常に楽しみにしていまして、伺いたいことがいっぱいあるんですけれども。Oh, I'm so happy. I love answering questions and I love talking about this topic. It's my favorite topic. じゃあ、あの、早速ちょっと本を読んでいて、いあの、一番気になったことを、えー、と伺いたいと思うんですけど、この本の中に、先生があの実際にされた実験のお話とかがいくつか出てきたと思うんですけれども、実験心理学のこう知り合いの先生とかにこう話を聞くと、論文を読んで、こんな実験思いつかなかったとか、その手の実験って、論文を読めば、確かにこう調べればいいじゃんと思うけれども、そのアイデアにすることが難しいっていうのをよく聞くんですね。先生の、その、はおそらくその実験が非常に上手な方だと、あの、感じたんですけれども、まず仮説を思いつくこともそうですし、それから検証法をこう自分の中で考えつくっていうのは、どのようにやっているんですか That's my favorite part about doing science. Coming up with ideas and figuring out how to test them. This is my favorite part about discovering things.、Mm. Like、I always have many, many ideas, more ideas than I can carry out experiments. I have a lot of people working in my lab. We currently have about a dozen experiments happening. <laughs> oh, I can't count because not all of them are going to be testable. But sometimes you notice something that as you interact with someone and you think, oh, that's interesting. So, how do we test it? But let me answer. So, two parts answer about methodology. So, of course, I also have. I went to college, so I have a bachelor's degree, then I have two master's degrees, and I have a PhD.、Hi. And I studied all these tools functional neuroimaging,、mm -hmm. EEG, eye tracking, mouse tracking, all the methods、mm -hmm. come from training and going to school. But then for ideas, I love to read widely in every area, not just in my field、mm -hmm. philosophy, biology, genetics, also fiction,、mm -hmm. poetry. and At the intersection of these different fields, I think that's where a lot of ideas come from. But then also meeting people, observing people, interacting pe with people, listening to people. Every person has so many interesting things to teach us. So, yeah. So, this book describes the experiments I've done up until a few years ago. But since then, we have a lot more experiments. So, right now, for example, I have a Uh, $3.5 million grant from the National Institute of Health to study the consequences of speaking different languages on things like decision making, creativity, memory, semantic organization. These are completely new experiments that are not even in the, in the book that we are collecting now. We are working with different languages, including Japanese. We have two Japanese studies right now. One is with, so we're doing a project with Japanese English bilinguals looking at mental health in Japanese English bilinguals,、mm -hmm. specifically at depression, anxiety, suicidality, and post traumatic stress, PTSD,、uh, across languages, and especially in older Japanese speakers. To see if they express differently in one language versus another. So that's for my next book. Thank you. Thank you. Now, in the bilingualism, the bilingualism of 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 the b i l i その例えばバイリンガルはそのモノリンガルに比べて記憶力が優れているとか、まあ、アルツハイマーの発症が遅れるっていう話があったと思うんですけど、まあ、それがその相関なのか因果なのかこう書き方としては因果にも読めそうでただ個人的にはこれはなんか単なる相関でしかないのかなっていうのがちょっと気になってこの辺り先生がどう考えてるのかをちょっと伺いたいです。To say that bilinguals have better memories is an oversimplification.、Mm -hmm. It's not true that every memory for everything is better.、No. Memory is a very broad term. There are some things that are changed, some types of memory that are changed by bilingual experience, and others that are not. No. No. But I'll give you an example why I don't think it's just correlation. So, for example, we have one experiment that we're doing right now. 
in which we show people objects. We record their eye movements as they look at the objects, move them around. Mm -hmm. And then later, we test their memory for these objects. What do they remember seeing? If the person we're testing only speaks Japanese and they were looking for photographs Mm -hmm. on the table and later you test them, what else was on the table? They are going to remember, they are more likely to remember that there are also bubbles on the Mm -hmm. table Mm -hmm. because the word for photographs and bubbles in Japanese sound a little bit similar at the beginning. They both start with sha, but if they also speak English, they will remember the photographs they will remember the bubbles and they will also remember that they saw a shadow Mm -hmm. because of shadow in Mm -hmm. English. Mm -hmm. So they don't have better memory for everything. Mm -hmm. It's not that they have a better memory for everything they saw, but they do have better memory for things that their language coactivates and kind of draws their mind's resources and their attention to. Mm -hmm. But if you speak a different language, like if you speak Russian and Japanese, you're going to remember that you saw uh maybe a, a, a balloon there because the russian word for balloon is starts with sha if you speak uh maybe english you're more likely to remember also a shark mm-hmm. it's, so it's really the language that guides what you will remember <laughs> yeah it is so your memory is influenced by the languages you speak this right. also also has implications for witnesses in legal testimonies, for therapy, bilingual therapy, for many other contexts. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned dementia, Alzheimer's and dementia. I think that's one of the most interesting and exciting Mm -hmm. um, findings in the field of bilingualism, that people who speak two or more languages have a delayed onset of Alzheimer's and dementia by four to six years. Mm -hmm. And here's one reason why it's not likely that it's correlation. I'll give you one one possible explanation why it's not correlational. So there is epidemiological data from different nations, from different countries, that shows that the more country, the more languages are spoken in that country, like official languages, because countries vary. Some countries just have one official language. Others have two official languages. Others have three or seven. So the the higher the number of languages, the lower the incidence of Alzheimer's and dementia in that country. It's on a national level you see these epidemiological differences. It seems that using two or more languages gives your brain a constant workout. It's like a constant exercise for your brain. It could, but it's not very likely that everyone born, for example, Canada, in Canada, uh, in Quebec, it's bilingual for French and English. And it's not very likely that everyone who lives in Quebec is genetically less predisposed to dementia and Alzheimer's than people just a few hundred miles south in the United States where English is the only official language. And it's important to understand that it's not that the brain does not deteriorate. Anatomically, the brain is as uh, impacted. So its damage is as much in bilinguals and as monolingual. So the brain is physiologically at the same uh, level. However, functionally, bilinguals compensate Mm -hmm. cognitively. So the anatomical structure of the brain is deteriorating, but the way they are functioning is higher. There are other variables that are known to offer some protective advantage against dementia. For example, a level of education, literacy, nutrition, exercise, and the effect size. The highest effect size is for exercise and bilingualism. Those two have equal effects in effect size. Mm-hmm. 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 Yes, exercise is, uh, is known to be very beneficial. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, there is no treatment right now at this time for dementia. Although um, just last week, the, uh, I think Eli Lilly announced a new drug that slows down the progression of dementia. So 
There are advantages made in medicine all the time. Until we have a treatment, behavioral and lifestyle changes like exercise and learning another language can help us along. ちょっとそれに関してまた質問したいんですけど今その言語を学ぶっていうこの本に関してもその新しい言語を学ぶことの価値っていうのをこう今までのまあ本とかだと楽しいっていうことにこう訴えているものが多かったと思うんですねその新しい言語を学ぶこと自体はもう書けねえなしにそれはいいことだと思うんですけれどもこの本のそのまあ言語を学ぶとかそれがバイリンガルっていうことがその例えば日本の場合だと基本的にはまあ日本語もちろん日本昭和とかもあるにせよあと大雑把に言って単一言語に近いような状況だと思うんですねでそういったその日本語が基本的に話されている国の中でこう例えば趣味で外国語を毎日勉強することと、えー、公用語が複数あるそして街を歩いていてもさまざまな言語が聞こえてくるような環境におけるバイリンガルっていうのはかなりそのじょいえー状況としても違うし、もしかしたらその先生のおっしゃってるような認知機能的な面でも異なるのかなと。つまり質問の様子としては、バイリンガルって言っても、理算的な概念じゃなくて連続的な概念だから、あんまりこう、この本の言われてることがそのまま日本だと適用できないのかなというのが気になったんですけれども。You made a very good observation that not every bilingual is the same. We are both bilingual, maybe, or trilingual, or quadrilingual, but our experiences differ at what age you learn the language, how you learned it, how fluent you are, how much you use it, how similar the languages are.、Mm-hmm. All of those variables differ. Similarly, cognition is a very broad term that encompasses many things. There is perception, there is memory, there is creativity, there is decision making, there is identity. All these cognitive variables. So, because you know about language, you have your question is more nuanced. This is why the story is so much more interesting and so much more rich. Sometimes people want a very simple black and white answer yes or no, and you know, saying bilinguals makes you better or worse. But that's not the right way to ask the question. The right way to ask the question is what aspects of language learning and language experience. Change what aspect of the mind, which is why you know this book basically just scratches the surface because there is so much to consider about different kinds of experiences.、Mm-hmm. So, you mentioned Japan specifically, there is so much to say because、um, language and culture are so tightly connected,、mm-hmm. and Japanese language is so interesting precisely because it gives us this window into the Japanese culture. So, when we study Japanese language, we also un- learn more about the culture and about. The Japanese way of thinking. The language tells us so much about how differently Japanese people think, for example, compared to speakers of other languages. So, when someone just starts studying Japanese, a new learner immediately notices that Japanese encodes so much consideration for others in its language. There is so Uh, there are so many words to uh, uh, express politeness and consideration for the feelings and the experiences of other people. For Japanese bilingu- people who are learning Japanese as their second language, it can be very difficult sometimes to be sensitive to the small nuances that are really encoded in this Japanese expression of reading the air. To be able to read the air. All the indirect requests, for example. Another thing about Japanese is that there are many different dialects spoken around the country. For example, I just got back yesterday from the Goto Islands, and there is a Goto dialect.、Mm-hmm. And we're just now starting to study whether speaking two or more dialects offers similar benefits or similar. Leads to similar differences as speaking two or more languages.、Mm-hmm. There is a famous linguistics joke that、um, goes something like this that a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, a dialect and a language is a continuum. So, so, some dialects are more different from each other than some languages、mm-hmm. because the definition is often politically and geographically imposed.、Mm-hmm. So, it's possible that Japanese speakers who think that they are monolingual, if they speak two very different dialects, actually their mind is working similar to the mind of a bilingual. <laughs> well, and another very important thing to consider. Is that so far we've used a very narrow definition of language. But language really is not just natural languages that you and I are using to communicate,、mm. it can also include artificial languages, 
Mm-hmm. It can also include music and it can also include math. Music and math are also a form of language. Mm-hmm. So even if you only speak Japanese, but if you're able to read music, if you're able to use math mm-hmm. in uh, advanced ways, your mind is in a way multilingual because it has multiple symbolic systems at its disposal. Mm-hmm. My definition of language is a system that uses symbols to transmit information across time and space. あの、大学とか言うと思ったら大学になる。そう、言うはマルティダイレクト。そうなんですね。そこれあの、どんだけお酒によってでもやろうとでもできるんですよ。I <笑> the city you are from. Mm-hmm. I went to Nagoya last last summer. Mm-hmm. And it's a beautiful city. I saw the castle. Mm-hmm. And uh, the people were so hospitable. Everyone was just so nice and friendly. Um, yes, <laughs> what a nice city. I, I was there for the for a conference on applied research in memory and cognition. So I like Nagoya very much. Mm-hmm. And then before I answer your question, I also want to circle back where you asked me about music and the music brain. We actually did an experiment a few years back where we compared monolingual, bilingual, monolingual musicians and bilingual musicians on inhibitory control, ability to inhibit irrelevant information. And all three groups, bilinguals, musicians and bilingual musicians perform better than the monolinguals. Mm-hmm. So it's true that music, music changes the brain as well. Yes. And then last to your dialect, you pr- if you speak the Nagoya dialect and other dialects, then you are bidialectal and probably benefit from that experience. Yes, so nice, and yeah. you mentioned being drunk and being able to speak <laughs> the different dialects. Um, there are actually experiments on memory for people in different states, including when they are inebriated versus not. <laughs> I did not do those experiments. This is other psychologists who did those experiments. But they are finding that things that happen or things that you learn, memories that you learn when you are inebriated after you've had alcohol, you remember them better once you have alcohol again. This is known as state-dependent memory. And there's also research on language-dependent memory. Similarly, things that you learn in one language, they are more likely to come back to you when you use that language again. So the mind is a very interesting thing.